Andy Lakin. It's just like everyone that I want to see. And the rest of you guys. Yeah. Okay. So um, I'm going to dive in real quick so we can uh, spend most of the time kind of looking at spreadsheets. So um, <coughs> this is a session. You're in a session um, about Google Spreadsheets. Lots of fun. Um, and the Google Spreadsheets and tools that we use at ThinkShout to be able to actually know what the heck we're doing. Um, so um, a little bit more about us and ThinkShout. Um, ThinkShout's based in Portland, Oregon. We're uh, about four and a half years old at this point. Um, it was started by me and Lev Sippen, my business partner. Lev is our uh, CTO, I'm our CEO. I manage more of the sales, marketing, strategy side of the shop, and then he manages our development team. Um, so uh, again, four and a half years old. Um, we started out just with the two of us, like Lev and I did the, the traditional thing, just two independent contractors subbing each other out for about a year, decided that, you know, it's a lot like getting married, starting a business, if you've done that um, with a business partner. Like, we just kind of, we courted each other, we got a prenup in place, all that stuff, um, and then decided to pull the trigger. Um, we just started out with, we each put 500 bucks in a bank account, um, and we were profitable on day one, which is really awesome with Drupal. You know, like, you can really, if you have some customers, you can just start billing and there's really not a lot of overhead to get started. Really fun. So um, now we're a team of full of 20 folks full time, all on site. Um, I think by the end of the year we'll probably be like 26. Um, we're starting a couple new initiatives and some new kind of support services, um, and uh, um, and growing. So we've done a lot of open source stuff, like everybody else in this room, I'm sure. Um, there's about 50,000 websites running on our code. You've probably used some of our modules, Mailchimp module. MailChimp's rad. Um, Red Hen CRM, our native CRM for Drupal. That, Salesforce Suite, we rewrote that for Drupal 7, um, and a lot of other stuff out there. Uh, leaflet module, stuff like that. Um, and, uh, and then uh, about, about a year ago now, we were ranked the ninth fastest growing company in Portland, Oregon, which is really pretty cool. Um, so what I want to kind of talk about is um, the tools that we've used to kind of I think, and it's a little presumptuous for me to say this, and so please hold me accountable and question me and all that, but like the stuff that we've done to kind of jump to that, I don't know, kind of mid-tier mid size, if you took kind of the averages of Drupal shops, we kind of like a lot of folks, um, I, w I don't want to say stalled out because we were doing really innovative work and hiring great people, but we kind of had a hump there around employee number like 10 to number 17 where there was kind of a lot of churn, and it was kind of an awkward phase for us. It was kind of like our teenage phase. You know, now I'd say that we're like really arrogant freshmen in college. Um, but like in, in, in our teens there, we, we really kind of made a lot of mistakes. And I think probably more important than anything, we didn't know what was going to happen at the end of every month when we did billing. Like we knew intuitively, oh yeah, we're profitable, we're doing fine, like we've got tons, we have we have the right cash reserves, like everything's stable, we're a stable, healthy company. But it was kind of this guessing game at the, ever the, at the end of the month, like the day before billing went out to say, what was our effective billing rate for this month? How much, you know, what was the average hour worth? You know, I, we, I knew basically what we were gonna invoice and basically what our costs were, so there's never any concerns there. Um, but it was a little, it's a little weird to be running a company that's based on building computer software and not know every single little detail. So what we're gonna talk about are kind of the tools that we use hopefully to kind of take us to the next step and the stuff that's allowed us to actually scale really quickly this calendar year in a way that we find really sustainable. Um, so uh, yeah, so we'll talk about that. Um, and then if you're interested tomorrow, just kind of uh, promoting another session, there is on the business track with this guy Kurt right here from Form One and me and Alex from ZivTech and Tracy from Balance Interactive, a panel on how to grow your business as well. So if you're interested in kind of more of the narrative side of things, there's some more sessions for that. Um, cool. And like I said to other folks, last time I'm going to say it, the, the, when I show the spreadsheets, they're really hard to see because this projector stinks. So please feel free to move forward and then feel free to leave at any point and not be held accountable for that. So it's totally okay to sit in the front row and leave. Um, all right. So what the problems were, you know, so I mean, to be totally honest, I kind of feel like, and this sounds, again, um, a little bit on the arrogant side, but to be honest, like I feel like anybody who has strong charisma and has like a vision and cares about what they want to do can probably build like a three to four to five to even 10 person shop. Like Drupal's really popular right now. If you've got spunk, you can make it work. But what I found is kind of what with that spunk and that what helps kind of folks like get these things started 
kind of on that double-edged sword is kind of the, the, the opposite side of what you really need to then grow that company. Like it's a different skill set. And sometimes that spunk can kind of get in the way. Um, so, you know, what I want to talk about is really kind of moving away from that intuitive decision-making process that a lot of us who founded shops have, have started off with. You know, it's how young shops work, early staffing decisions. It's like, can we hire this guy? And like, can, can me and my business partner work enough hours into the evening to make sure that we can always hit payroll for that first employee, regardless of whether or not we can bill them? You know, so you can kind of just gut it and just kind of make things work. Um, <coughs> probably some stuff, if you're a smaller shop you've encountered, or a younger shop, you know, it feels like it's always all hands on deck all the time. If you want to specialize, if you want to like innovate, a lot of times you're doing it at night. You're doing it on the weekends. You know, you're working for your business all the time, so you don't have that time to really work on your business, you know. Um, and any kind of sales and operations stuff, that stuff you're just bootstrapping on the weekends and whenever you can, you know. So that's kind of like the early days, at least our early days. Um, so, you know, you get to this point where you start want to wanting to track data. Um, some things that we've found in starting this that I think are useful points. Um, one, um, uh, how many of you guys use a, a time tracking system? Like everybody. Um, good, that's a pretty important first step. Um, but, you know, when you start tracking data, what our experience was is that there's, there's, there's good metrics and meaningful metrics, and then there's really lazy metrics. You know, um, one of the metrics that we used a lot um, that is really lazy and what we found actually just in the last couple months we've kind of made a shift from. Um, it used to be that we tracked, how many of you guys have your developers or your staff track all of their time, like all 40 hours a week? Yeah. So we were doing that and we were evaluating the success of developers based upon the lazy metrics we were getting there. If somebody logged 42 hours a week, every week, they worked harder than somebody who logged 41 hours or who worked 39 hours, you know? Um, and it was because we were just trying to have as much data as we could. But if you think about it and take a step back, is that really meaningful? Like the fact that somebody didn't, somebody put a timer on on the weekend when they were doing some research and another person decided not to do that? Like is that really how you want to evaluate whether two staff, how two staff are performing? So we've made the shift and now we only track billable hours. Um, because we realize, not that we realize that, you know, tracking the energy and enthusiasm and commitment of our staff isn't important, but just how long they had the clicker, the, the timer running, wasn't what was really going to track that. You know, because you get that situation where someone just leaves a timer running to go um, use the restroom. You know, like you don't know. Like you can't really know those level of details. So trying to use that as, as information is lazy and probably doesn't give you the best data or the best information. Um, so a couple other things. Yeah, yeah. Right, and you're not capturing that. If the only thing, if you only have a chance to look at like five numbers and one of those numbers is total hours in your time tracking system, are you really getting the information that you need? So we've started to kind of question that. Um, the other thing is just kind of understanding what data is really good enough. Um, so, you know, we've had the pitfall of trying to work out some sort of big, crazy tool to figure something out. Um, and it was overkill, and we ended up just missing opportunities to see data sooner. Um, but then also on the flip side, kind of recognizing what kind of information you need to actually say that you're starting to see trends. So um, we've just been like kind of with Agile, like we're not an Agile shop necessarily. Um, we're an iterative shop, but uh, just kind of iterating on the tools and the reports that we're trying to do. And kind of the last kind of big learning that I've had um, in doing all this stuff is uh, prediction as part of measurement. So um, when we build a tool, like when I built the spreadsheets I'm going to show you, one of the things that's been really critical for us is like use the tool predict the results that we're going to get, and then at the end of the month or whatever the reporting period is, going back and reviewing that. And that way I can actually see if the logic that we're using, if it's, if it's really the right tool to figure out the information that I want to figure out. Um, <coughs> so kind of an overview of the tools that we're going to show you, and then we're just going to dive into some really nerdy spreadsheets for a little while. Um, so kind of an overview of our system and our tools for tracking our business. Try and tracking tool. How many of you guys use Harvest? Um, uh, what else out there? Somebody who feels really passionate about some other tool, time tracking tool, tell me what it is. Fresh books. Fresh books. With how many folks? Okay, awesome. Yeah, that's really cool. Anything else that people really like? Jira Tempo. Awesome. Okay. We use Toggle, but we're not sure. We're not Toggle. Yeah, awesome. What were you using? Uh, we use Teamwork, but I'm not sure. Okay, Teamwork. Cool. Okay. Yeah, so we use Harvest. There's no right answer there. Um, 
one thing that we like about Harvest, I'm skipping a bullet point here, is uh, the new Forecast app. For, they bought, I guess they bought ForecastApp.com, and they're rolling it in as an extra service. Forecast app, like we haven't used it in production admittedly, but it's a resourcing tool for staffing, and it's awesome. Um, it looks really awesome. It looks like it's really cool. It'll show you if you have people overbooked. It combines that against your project budget. So it's actually, we're pretty excited about it, and it might cut out a spreadsheet that we've been using, and that's really hard to, to work with. So, um, Cool. So time tracking, the key thing, resource allocation spreadsheet. I'm not going to show you what that looks like because those are actually, there's a lot of ways to do that. Um, there's two that I really want to kind of dive into um, in detail, and one would be we have a, a billable hours matrix that we use, and we're going to dive into that. Um, and then uh, what we call like an aggregated pipeline tool um, that allows us to kind of see, allows us to forecast how much money we're going to make a month from now, two months from now, and so forth. So we're going to dive into that. Um, and then putting it all together, um, what sort of, what, what accounting, we're QuickBooks online folks. What other accounting stuff do you guys use? Zero, okay, awesome. Zero, you know, it, it, when I first looked at zero, it seemed like it was better for folks inter, um, outside of the U.S. Like there was actually better adoption. It's out of New Zealand, right? Yeah. yeah so, that's awesome. Okay, zero. Oh, you do. Okay. Yeah, we've kind of gone QuickBooks because accountants tend to, you know, be more familiar with it. So we, we, it just saves us money on the account on the CPA side. Um, but that's interesting. Any other tools that folks are using for accounting stuff that's been really useful? Just works. Okay, I'm not familiar with that one. Cool. Okay. Yeah, that's neat. Yeah, it's outside of the topic of this presentation. Um, we've uh, also, just as a quick tip, we've uh, adopted Zenefits. I don't know if anybody's using Zenefits or heard of them. Yeah. Zenefits is awesome. I mean, it's completely revolutionized our business. So Zenefits is a, a service as well as a, it's a web app as well, but more importantly, a service that, that does benefits managing. Um, and it's being, it's, it's a startup, so they kind of have this IT feel. Um, and there, there's a really great suite of tools, but they basically, they manage all of our all the procurement on healthcare, all that stuff, they provide a portal for it all. It's absolutely incredible and it's saved us a ton of time. What's that? Cool. Um, yeah, so check out Zenefits. It's really great. The CEO of the company, and it's like a 300 person company, actually onboards all the customers directly. I mean, like, their tools are that efficient. It's amazing. It's absolutely crazy. Cool. Okay, so we're going to dive into spreadsheets. The last thing I kind of want to say with all of this, um, and this has been useful, a kind of a concept for us as we've been rolling out these spreadsheets, because obviously, you know, this, these spreadsheets are really great tools for founders or, you know, executive staff, but you're probably going to be showing this stuff or it's really going to impact your team. Um, and so, you know, there's a bit of a risk when you roll out any kind of tool or kind of change your practices around tracking or managing expectations with your team. So uh, we've kind of had to develop, a, we've developed a, a messaging framework about that and a way of thinking about that with our staff to make sure that they understand what's going on. Um, so this is just kind of, you know, everything that we're doing in terms of the reporting kind of comes back to these three things that we're really trying to support internally. And whatever framework, whatever values you might have, inter internal values with your team, it could be whatever you want. But for us, the idea of, you know, we're really trying to balance innovation and clients, customer success or client success with staff satisfaction. So as we're, like, adjusting and tinkering with all these things, it's all in service to this. And so that way, like, if we roll out a new policy with our team and it fails, we can really kind of talk about that transparently with our team and, and let them understand that like, this is the balance we're trying to hit. We're not always going to hit it. Sometimes we're going to be in more service to our staff. We're going to send a boatload of people to DrupalCon, even though it might not make the most sense business-wise. Um, we're going to like, or on the flip side, we might have a couple weeks where we have to really push it and we're going to skip staff lunches or skip sprints and we're all going to work really hard on client stuff. So having this in place really allows us to kind of implement um, solutions that are coming out of the data we're looking at. Does that make sense? What's that? Zenefits. It's like benefits, but with a Z instead of a B. Zenefits.com. Cool. All right. So um, now we're going to dive into some spreadsheets. So um, if my Twitter handle is, I didn't have a great way of doing this. My Twitter handle is Sean underscore Larkin. Um, or you can just find ThinkShout on Twitter. And there's 
I link to this. Like, so all of the materials that I have here and all the spreadsheets, it's all in a Google Drive folder and it's all available to you guys. So please grab it, take it, manipulate it, use it however you want to use it. <coughs> There's no secret sauce. Um, so it's all out there if you just want to find a link on Twitter. Um, but just because I didn't obviously want to use like actual client data um, or tell you exactly how much money we make um, or whatever. Um, so the spreadsheets have all been adjusted a little bit um, to use uh, the Mongolian Turek. Has anyone ever used this currency? I have not. You have? You were were you awesome. Um, I intentionally did not even look up the exchange rate, anything like that. It's just a placeholder. They had, a, they had the coolest currency symbol in, in uh, Google Docs, so we used it for that reason. But um, so none of this, this stuff's all been abstracted. It's not real data. There's no like algorithm to try to figure out what it would be in real life. Um, but you'll see that, um, and we'll dive into this. So one last thing before we dive into the spreadsheets. Um, it, sound, it sounds like really simple, but for a long time, like I couldn't figure out why my forecasts weren't all that great um, in terms of revenue stuff. Um, we do all of this forecasting, and you'll see it in here for the most part by week as opposed to by month. And that's because there's different numbers of business days in every month. So your targets for each month should probably change on the revenue side, um, maybe even on the costing side, depending on how you think are set up. Um, so if you get confused as to how some of the equations work, that's kind of what's going on there. All right. So we are going to dive in and get going here. So um, cool. One other thing that you'll find in here that just really helpful, um, uh, a plug to someone that we don't even work with. Um, these guys, we were put onto them by uh, the great folks here at Four Kitchens. I know that Lullabot uses them as well, but Summit CPA Group, they're a virtualized CFO firm. From what I hear, they're awesome. Yeah, they're really great, um, and they've helped a lot of Drupal shops really kind of navigate complex, um, you know, shareholder arrangements and profit sharing policies and all kinds of stuff like that. <coughs> but one thing they put out at the um, operations camp, operations camp I also heard is really cool. Did you go? Oh yeah, we should have hooked you up. We had people there. Um, operations camp, great conference. It's it's more business operations, but it also kind of touches on project management operations and stuff like that too. Um, but it's an annual conference. Uh, it was just down in uh, Louisiana. Um, but this came out of that. Um, so these are just some metrics that they recommend that you uh, take uh, or pay attention to if you're running your business. Um, we won't really run through this right now, but just as a reference, um, it's something that might be interesting, and it's in the Google Drive. Cool. All right. So the two spreadsheets that uh, I am uh, kind of most proud of that you can't see were the dam from way back there. Um, so again, please feel free to come up. Um, this billable hours matrix, and then an under what we're calling like a, a, a pipeline report or under contracts. So these two things work together. Um, this billable hours matrix is like the core thing that we figure out what are reasonable expectations for our developers, um, for our strategists, for our designers in terms of what can we expect from them um, to do in terms of uh, work for us. So I'm going to jump the size up here a little bit. Um, again, we're using our Mongolian currency. So um, cool. So, and I'm going to walk you through this. And then again, like you grab a copy of this, use it, do whatever you want with it. Um, cool. So the first thing that we try to figure out is kind of like, what is our you know abstract profit margin that we want to hit? Um, for us, it's generally something between you know, 15% and, you know, maybe even like 22, 23% in a crazy big month where we kind of want to catch up on stuff or really focus on client success. Um, so we kind of looked at that and then, you know, everything else here is trying to figure out, well, how can we support that goal while also supporting other internal goals that we have as our team? Um, so um, the core, there's a couple assumptions here. And again, just spreadsheet assumptions here. You can adjust this. This assumes in this case it costs us you know, 100,000 Mongolian Turks a month to pay our staff with our current size. Um, and our target effective billing rate is um, uh, going to be 100 Turks uh, per hour. So this is an interesting thing. What is effective billing rate? There's so many people that define that really differently. In our case here, it's, I guess it's kind of like average billing rate. So all of the hours that we're working on client stuff, what do we want the average hour that's serving cli clients or working on client projects to be worth? Okay. Some people, yeah, like I said, some people call that um, average billing rate, and then they use effective billing rate to include all hours that are non-client related. Um, in this case, this is just saying 
average, averaged out for when we're actually doing client work. And then kind of what is your base number of hours per week per staff? So that's kind of where we start here. Um, and then we go through our team um, for each role, and I try to figure out what people are actually going to be working on. And this is, if you've ever tried to solve this, this is a, a complex problem too. <coughs> when you talk about like effective, um, you know, the utilization, it, it gets really confusing what people call utilization when they're talking about their staff. So for us, we have like a maximum utilization and then a realistic util utilization. Um, because community, and mainly we have these two distinctions because communicating around these expectations to staff is really difficult. You know, if you tell staff, it's really kind of confusing when you tell staff, hey, if you work 40 hours this week, we want you to do 32 or 35 or what, however many billable hours you have. Well, then what happens when there's a vacation day? Like, does that change the number of billable hours and so forth? So, like, it gets really confusing as to how you talk about this stuff um, with your teams. So we kind of have broken out both options here. So each staff by position, you know, we're assuming that they work 40, 40 hours a week. Um, and then we say, okay, you know, on a 40-hour week, if they only did client work, um, what's a realistic expectation? So if they're not taking vacation, they don't have a conference and all of that, you know, for this role, for this designer role, I'm assuming that you're going to work 32 billable hours that week. Um, and then you kind of go through each of these staff people, project managers. Uh, if you're like us, your project managers are having more contact switches, so you expect on a 40-hour week that they're probably not going to be able to bill as much because they're as a as a developer because they're not heads down working. So we kind of run through that, and that gives us kind of, in that kind of ideal situation, how many billable hours could we possibly hit in a week. So with this team here, that's kind of got three unbillable staff on it um, and nine billable staff that are all billing different, different amounts because they have different roles. We're assuming that they could do like 300 and just shy of 350 hours. Um, so that's kind of the course high-level stuff in terms of how we talk with our staff. But the reality is that we have people that are doing a lot of different things. And we have senior engineers who we want to do presentations at Drupal cons. And maybe our junior engineers have other stuff that we want them to prioritize. So, you know, we're not asking them, we're not investing in them doing speaking engagements quite yet. You know, they're really focused on developing their own skills. So here we've kind of broken out, and this could be different for anybody, for all of our, for anybody here. What are the realistic things that we're looking for them to do each week based upon their roles and their interests and so forth? So these are kind of the big buckets that we're using. Again, this isn't translating the time tracking, but just in terms of expectation management. You know, management responsibilities for people who are leading teams. You know, there's a couple folks who might have that and so forth. Um, and this allows us to say, okay, on average, looking at vacation time and PTO and all this other stuff that we know we're going to have, DrupalCon, the nonprofit technology conference, whatever it might be, what, um, what can we actually expect on, a re on an average week in terms of the billable hours that this, the this team is producing. So there's a big gap there, you know. If everybody was just working and not taking PTO, 350 hours. But knowing that people do take PTO, and they should, probably about 278 hours. So, um, so that lets us kind of really kind of get a, a bigger picture of what is actually going to happen in our business. So down here in this part, what we're doing here is we're just projecting out, okay, we know what our costs are, we know what our salaries, we want our salaries to be, and we know how much people can work. What could we expect in this scenario in terms of profitability in these two scenarios? The ideal, everybody's cranking 40 hours, and then the realistic, people taking vacation and so forth. So that allows us to kind of sanity check, okay, well, if all this stuff is working the way we think it is and our costing is right, we can expect under this scenario to get about 16% profit margin in the realistic scenario of having folks actually take vacation and so forth. And then we can kind of play with that, you know. So if we want to pump that up, then we could make a business decision, well, you know what, um, some of these unbillable tasks here, like team sprints, instead of doing sprints every, every month, we're going to do a sprint every other month. And that might allow us to get more billable hours out, you know, out the door each week um, and pop that and, and bump that profitability margin up. Or on the flip side, if that margin is like, because of your equation, is working out to be like 20% profitability, well, maybe, maybe you need to focus more on long-term innovation as a marketing strategy um, and start including more meaningful sprints with your team. Take, you know, uh, a day every month off or every other month off with your team to, to work on some open source project that, that isn't client related. Does that make sense? Cool. <coughs> so kind of having figured this out, 
Um, it allows us to actually start doing some forecasting um, for what we can expect for the rest of the year. So I'm assuming on this spreadsheet here that we're starting out um, in January and, and looking at the whole year. So what we have here, um, and all these spreadsheets are all, inter uh, tabs are all interact interactive, obviously, is pulling over from that, that matrix that I had. Here's that team that we have right here. Um, this is what their monthly targets are. And then this is, um, you know, showing what we can expect each month. And what this allows us to do, that is an ugly spreadsheet right there, um, is um, start to um, uh, uh, get a sense of what sort of what growth might look like if we start hiring a different folk, additional folks. So for us, we just kind of kept it really granular here and assumed that, you know, average engineers, like how many people we're going to hire over the course of the year. This is not real. We're going to hire a different strategy, but just kind of to show you, okay, well, let's say in June we hire another developer, then, um, and then we're in July let's hire a designer, and then a themer, and then another engineer. And that allows us to kind of get a sense of, well, what, what are the total billable hours that we can expect in this growth scenario for the course of the year? Um, this variance right here, and this deviation, is kind of like allows us to kind of worst case scenario stuff. You might not need this. We've just kind of find, found it helpful to like, in terms of managing expectations, to kind of think about, well, Certain months, maybe we know that we are probably going to decide to do some strategic open source contributions or send a bunch of people to conferences. So maybe adjust, being able to kind of adjust down or up each month in the way that we know it's going to be. Um, but again, that allows us, this allows us to kind of forecast, well, how many billable hours are we going to have this whole year if this scenario works? And then, you know, given that effective billing rate or that average billing rate, what can we expect in terms of revenue um, with this growth pattern that we have here? And this kind of allows you to start playing with it. And we've actually used this in practice, kind of like we'll get more specific and be like, well, we know we're hiring somebody next month, but they start mid-month, you know. So actually just saying that they're not, they're not an expense for that full month. They're not going to bill for that full month. They're only going to bill for half of it. Or being able to say, well, we're hiring a junior person, and they're going to have some ramp-up time. So let's kind of get specific about the hours that they're going to provide. Um, and that allows us to kind of get a sense for what our total revenues are. And then down here, <coughs> just because we can, we can start to just kind of do some month of, to month over tracking to see how well this model is working for us. So where it gets interesting is actually then translating this to profit. It doesn't really matter how much revenue you make. Well, I guess it does in some, some ways. But um, start thinking about profit here. So um, this is, again, just kind of linking off the last spreadsheet. This is our current base, those 14 staff. You can see this number goes up. Just I just added a little multiplier saying that, you know, obviously the staff we currently have, they want raises. Those bastards. Um, and so uh, assuming that, you know, that base, that base salary is going to go up. And then looking, you know, this is really coarse, but looking at what are our additional costs if we start bringing on these other developers, that allows us to get kind of what our projected costs are. Um, and then compare that to our revenue to kind of get a sense of kind of predicting what what our profitability would be for the year in these different growth scenarios. Does that make sense? Cool. Um, so you can kind of see what, how that impacts, you know, what your forecast would be for that year if you, if you hit those targets. Um, and then this last tab, um, and this one is the most uh, kind of arcane, and I don't really know a great way of doing this stuff yet. I'd love to talk to somebody else who has incredible sales uh, metrics and forecasting and stuff like that. Um, but what kind of a pipeline do we want to maintain, a sales pipeline do we want to maintain to be able to hit these revenue targets? So um, here are those revenue targets that have been, I'll bump this one up. Um, here are the revenue targets that we brought over from the second tab. And then, um, you know, what size pipeline do we want to maintain to be able to hit that? And this is where it's kind of a weird, it's not, it's a pseudoscience. Essentially, um, you know, because just because you have something in your sales pipeline, you're not going to, obviously, that doesn't translate to revenue that month, you know. So this is kind of me guessing around saying, well, you know, I really want this pipeline to reflect the revenue goals that I have next quarter or three months down the pike. So, um, you know, uh, oops, um, that's not a good number. Um, what kind of revenue goals would I, what, what, how big do I want that sales pipeline to be? And, and how do I actually kind of want to weight the value of that pipeline, knowing that it's not all going to close? So um, does that make sense? Cool. 
So this is again like this is what this tool here, this billable hours matrix, is what we use to kind of like do the theoretical work to kind of figure out what our goals are. And again, you know, the goals change and you can adjust them. You know, you might decide over the summer, like summers are gonna be when we really innovate. Drupal 8's coming out, so we know, okay, this summer, we're probably gonna reduce the number of billable hours that we focus on um, so that we can have better Drupal 8 preparedness. Um, and then, you know, in the fall, we're gonna crank it back up and really focus on client work. And this stuff is important, again, in terms of messaging to your team because they wanna understand what the logic is in terms of the decisions that you're making as a business owner or as a, as a, as a team manager. They wanna understand that there is some sort of logic going into those decisions so it doesn't feel arbitrary. Cool. All right, so this is my pride and joy, the thing that I love the most um, of anything that we use in our company. Um, it's what we call an under contracts spreadsheet. Um, and our team, our project managers, Marcy can tell you over there, we probably spend, you guys spend 15, 20 minutes on this every day? Yeah, so it's like three, it's got like four or five people updating this thing kind of throughout, like kind of asynchronously all the time. We tried to think of other tools for this, and I hate using a Google spread, like having so much of the business based on a single Google spreadsheet, but like we just couldn't find anything that worked. So the, the problem that this spreadsheet's trying to solve is um, how do I figure out, like I said at the, head of the, at the start of this, how do I figure out how much money I'm gonna make next month? You know, so I know that I've got like, you know, I don't know, 15 projects or five projects, or whatever that number might be. And because, you know, business is business, I gotta negotiate different rates for different customers. Some people are at a historical rate, some people are at a new rate. Some projects have technical debt. Um, you know, so that's kind of pulling down the effective billing rate on that project. Like, how do I actually know, it's, you know, it's, uh, it's May 12th right now, how do I know how much money I'm gonna make this month, you know? Um, so, uh, so that's what this thing is intended to kind of solve. And then beyond that, like, you know, three months from now, what, how much money am I gonna make three months from now? I got the same, I got some projects that are gonna be finished by then. Um, I've got stuff in the sales pipeline that might be at, you know, maybe we're doing awesome and so we're gonna, we have stuff in the sales pipeline at a much higher rate. Um, or maybe I, I'm a little desperate three months from now and so, you know, or I wanna take on something that's technically risky because it's a really cool project and it'll let me do a technology that I wanna play with. So I know that there's probably gonna be some technical debt on a project that I'm, that's probably gonna close in the next month and that will start three months from now. How do I figure out, do I have the right suite of current projects, support projects, and new business? So that's what this spreadsheet's trying to solve. Um, so it starts out with a tab that's just every single contract every single opportunity that's on the board. Um, and it might actually be stuff that's closed out too. So this first tab here gets really long for us. Um, so I'll show you at kind of a high level here. And it, you, again, you don't know what the heck's going on from that view. Um, but essentially it's every contract and then a bunch of parameters about each one of them. Um, we do not work with uh, uh, Major League Baseball, but just as an example here. Um, so we have a line for each of these. The other thing that this does, what we found, is that actually this spreadsheet, everybody on our team, everybody who's managing projects, pretty much everyone but the development team or the design team, uses this tool all day long. Because the other thing that we found that it does is, it's just like kind of the one document of record. Like how many of you guys have, at this point in your business, have like probably some Google Drive folder that has like 100 contracts in it? You know, like how do you know how to find them? You know, and like you try to do naming conventions and then, Business development people, we're terrible at naming conventions. We throw stuff all over the place. So how do you actually keep all that stuff straight to know what contract you're working on? <coughs> so we came up with a contracting naming convention here, and this translates to Harvest. Harvest has really great project codes. These, these client codes, this is kind of our document of record for client codes. Client codes are really easy to implement in, in QuickBooks. It allows us to kind of actually have everything on the right naming convention here. Um, so our contract IDs here, um, it took a lot to, for the nerds to get the biz dev people to be cool with this, but uh, the naming convention here, um, you can't really see it, but it's the client code, then um, there's an M for the master, you know, the master services agreement that we're working under, so, um, you know, the, the MSA um, that we're using, the scope of work, the SOW has a naming convention, and then this last part here, the C and then the zeros, that's change orders. So that allows us to actually have kind of like our own Dewey Decimal System to kind of track like, okay, this project is a change order, but it, to which scope of work, and then 
which master services agreement do I go back to if I need to kind of understand the contracting terms. It allows us to kind of see how all that stuff works out. Um, you know, this is just a link to, the, to that document in Google Drive, the link to the Harvest project. So this is, the idea here is that anytime we bring on a new project manager or account manager, they can just use this form here and know where to go to actually figure out what's going on. That was like, and when I talked about that awkward stage, like we had a project manager leave. Um, I think we had two project managers leave between the size of like, you know, from being 12 to being like 20. And those are incredibly expensive transitions for project information, but also just account information. Like, how do you figure out what change order that, that PM kind of got sign off on and all of that? So this, allow, this document allows us to manage that. And again, for each of these line items, what is it? Is it a scope of work? Um, is it a master services agreement? Like, so not, you know, is it a change order? Is this a support contract? Or is this a proposal that we're managing? Um, and what's cool here too, if variables in Google, in Google Docs are awesome, I can actually just define these pick lists in a spot here. Um, I, I don't have it turned on now because I wanted you to be able to use this tool, but uh, Google Docs actually has really great new uh, cell protection, like to be able to have certain tabs or certain ranges actually be protected. So this way you can kind of like your admin, you can set this stuff up, let your project managers use it, but there's certain stuff that you know that they can't accidentally hit a keystroke and kill everything. So I kind of manage what these, these tabs are, what these uh, pick lists are. Um, but we have our, you know, type, um, our status, you know, so this is, is, is this an active project? Is it in sales? Is it on hold? Is it completed? Is it a deprecated, meaning that like we had this scope of work and then we, we gave it to the client. We, we have a copy of it in Google Drive, but it's not the one we're working off of. Or, you know, we actually even use it for like managing sales metrics, like did we lose the project? Where did we disqualify the lead, all of that, so that we can do a lot of reporting on this. AMs and PMs, this has kind of become our document of record to figure out, wait, we've got like four project managers and like three account managers, who the heck is, is responsible for this project? Like as you grow, it gets more and more difficult to think about all that and keep it all in your head. Uh, percentage likelihood to close, this is gonna come in when we talk about sales stuff. Um, date we want it, date we started it, date we completed it. The contract value, which in most cases is, um, I'm gonna drop the size here just a little bit. Can you still see it okay? Um, contract value, which is gonna be, you know, billable hours under contract times billable rate. Um, unbillable hours under contract. So this has actually been really helpful too. Um, we were struggling with like, not all of our contracts are set up the same way. Um, we'd love it if it was just like we negotiate a rate, everything's billable. But sometimes you have cl you know clients where you need to have um, <coughs> certain line items be listed as unbillable, or we'll donate this feature. So how do you actually manage that? You know, some projects it's like flat, it's flat rate. Other projects it's a rate plus a you know a, a discount of hours and features and stuff like that. So this kind of allows us to kind of normalize all of that. Um, when we get into this looking at support work, like what's the max velocity that we can work on a project? You know, is this contract set up so we can only do 10 hours a month of support? Um, and then what are we actually tracking? Um, what do we actually tracked against these contracts in Harvest? So this is admittedly a bit of a pain in the butt to actually have to go through this and update um, what the actuals are in, in Harvest. Um, to, uh, to know kind of like, okay, well we have this contract for 100 hours, we've done 50 hours, how many hours do we have left? What's the value of this contract moving forward? So it's a little bit of a pain in the butt. Marcy, would you agree? Whatever. Um, Marcy does this stuff. Um, you know, it's a little bit of a pain, but the one thing that we've done um, just to kind of make it a little bit easier is like, so we had these reports and then we would say, we would actually just have a different one, like we would change the date of the report to say, okay, let's do this all at once. But what's interesting is when you get a lot of project managers, they can't all just like do this on the same day at the same time. So we've kind of, and, and again, it's, it's a little old school to have to be doing this, but we have this date checked value in here that says, okay, this is the last time that this line of this spreadsheet has been looked at. Um, and that allows us to do updates to this spreadsheet asynchronously you know, different people can touch it anytime they want throughout the week and we can kind of take track, pay attention to that. So this is just a date field and what's kind of cool about it is that we have this uh, conditional formatter in there in Google Spreadsheets, just uh, format, conditional formatting, 
that says if the date checked is uh, um, not within eight days, show that line item is red, show that contract is red. So this for me as a, as a manager, is that, it sounds silly, but it's like a huge thing to have that in there. Because I can look at the spreadsheet and if I see a lot of red, it means that the data is probably not, the data is a little stale. So it's just kind of this visual indicator to me that, oh, okay, like I'm not using the most recent data. I want to, obviously there's, for us, there's always going to be some amount of red in the spreadsheet. We can't update everything all the time. But this way I can kind of see, okay, am I working with good data or bad data? <coughs> um, and I can, again, I can figure out what my tolerance is for bad data in terms of the decisions I'm trying to make. So this is kind of the data side here. So this is everything. Sales, you know, we have another conditional formatter. If something's in sales, it automatically just turns to green. If it's been completed, we just kind of have it, uh, you know, grayed out. But this is everything. So and for our copy of this, we've been using this for about two or three months. This tab here is big. It's like, you know, there's hundreds, there's probably 100 lines on it at this point. Um, but again, it kind of surfaces the stuff we need to surface with sorting and stuff. So where it gets really cool is actually... The, the, the spreadsheets that deal with this data. So pretty much the only thing that our staff touches is this first tab, and everything else is just getting calculated for us, and it's just providing reports. Um, so there's this cool function in, in Google Spreadsheets that I'm hiding here. Um, uh, the filter function in Google Spreadsheets, it'll actually do dynamic filters. So, um, so essentially what this filter is doing here is it's actually creating an entire list from that initial proposal of all of the contracts that are um, that are listed as uh, active, so it's pulling this data here, and it's just pulling in that data straight away from the other tab and filtering the data that I want to see. Um, does that make sense? So I hide all of that because it's not really useful, and then this is all calculations based upon. Um, this is all just doing some calculations based upon what I'm seeing there. And the long and the short of this thing is, it allows me to say, these are all the stuff that we have under active project. This is not support work. This is not sales work. These are just builds, like feature development, you know, new features, whatever we have, like a scope of work for and a project plan and a budget. It grabs all of that. And what it does is it says, okay, for everything active, given what we've updated here in the other tab from Harvest, um, and I'll make this big because it's, um, what do we have left to do? You know, and again, this was one of those things that like every time I wanted to figure this out before the spreadsheet, I'd sit down in a coffee shop for like four hours and I'd go through every single contract and every single project in Harvest on a piece of scrap paper and I would try to figure out what this meant. I never knew. It was like such a pain that I probably did that only like once a quarter. So I didn't really have good insight. It was all just intuitive. So this is saying in this scenario, given everything that we've recorded and done, here's the billable hours we have available for us. This technical debt, this has also been something that's been incredibly helpful. So going back to that contracts and proposals, I have a column that says, what do I predict as of today is the technical debt that I'm going to need to do for this project that I'm not going to get paid for to make everything work, you know? Uh, um, that's a good question. Everybody kind of defines it differently. For us, it would be the client's not going to be happy unless we do these 10 hours and we're not going to get paid for them, you know? Um, it could be other stuff. I mean, so for us, it's like, and harvest, it depends a lot. A lot of the stuff has to get adapted to the tool, which kind of stinks, but like harvest with kind of the way that the billing stuff goes, we just found the easiest thing was to have our rates per project. We do a blended rate. If you do, um, if you do a rate card, this stuff, I don't know how you're going to do this stuff. That's just, I, I, Kurt, maybe you guys have this stuff with a rate card. I don't know, like predicting, yeah. No, just in general, like, if you're doing, like, how do you know, like, how many hours you have available at the different rate card rates? <coughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, and those are, you guys have 100 plus people at different different types of problems, different types of, um, oh yeah, okay. Um, yeah, so different types of problems, but uh, for us with the blended rate, this kind of works. So yeah, so it's just how many hours are we going to need to do, you know, like we know we finished this, we know we have a time and materials contract, but like goodwill is not going to be saved unless we do some extra work. And obviously we'd love for that to be zero, but that's just never the case, you know. 
It's not realistic. It's a little, it's not a technical definition of technical definition. It's not, no. It's like, it's a, we put a junior developer on this and they messed up a CSS thing and we're not going to build a client for it. Um, and so, but this is also something that we, act, this number right here is huge for us because it kind of just lets us say, this is all the technical debt. Because then the next decision that's outside of the spreadsheet is, I've got 50 hours of technical debt that I'm not going to get paid for. How do I manage that in terms of cash flow and client expectations, you know? Um, so that's a whole other conversation about how to manage that. But, like, that number basically, or this number is also helpful when I'm trying to negotiate a new sales contract. And, it, again, it's some project using some cool technology, and I know I'm not going to get billed for all of it, and I want, but I really want that engagement, so I'm going to give something away. How much can I give away, given the amount of technical debt that I have moving forward that I know I have to give away? Um, so that aggregate number is helpful. Um, uh, technical debt, outstanding work. The value of all the outstanding work, again, this is saying how many hours versus the rate that I'm probably going to get paid in reality for this work. Um, and that's kind of, uh, that's, and the order of these is a little off, I just realized. But that's kind of taking the effective billing rate and multiplying it by the outstanding work. So again, I've kind of got a color coding uh, conditional field here. These numbers here, these effective billing rates, um, if it drops, I have a threshold of 100 uh, Mongolian currency pieces for this. If it drops below that, it turns red. And that, as an owner, I, I look at this number right here all the time, and I'm trying to figure, to figure out, oh, I'm sorry, I jumped spreadsheets. To, um, but to, to figure out, again, like, um, am I in trouble? And are we dropping below the effective billing rate that we need to be able to, to hit our revenue goals? And if I am, that means, well, maybe I need to have some more uncomfortable conversations with some clients to say, hey, like, we just, this isn't a month where, this isn't a, a month or a two month period, as I spill everything all over my computer, um, where we can afford to do a lot of unbillable extra work, you know? Or, or vice versa, you know, maybe you, you know, these, these conversations aren't static. Like the way you, obviously, the way you approach conversations with customers about do, uh, stuff outside of contract, it changes. Some months you might have, you might be doing great. And so you're like, you know what, this month we've been cranking out billable hours. I'm going to have a higher tolerance for a customer saying, hey, could you just do me a favor and do this extra feature here and not bill me for it, you know? Um, this gives us a framework for that. Um, so, again, this is for our active projects. And what's been helpful, what's helpful here is actually saying these having two separate lines here. One is, what is our effective billing rate for all of our um, outstanding work? So all the contracts that we have, the amount of work we've done is the amount of work we've done. Just moving forward, what can I expect to bill? And then related to that, but different, is what is the effective billing rate on those contracts? So including the work under those contracts, the open contracts, including the stuff that we've billed already. So those are two different data points there, right? And it's helpful in different decisions, with different decisions to be able to see either one. Largely, this, this one's the most important. How much money am I going to make? Everything's done up till today. How much money can I make moving forward? Um, so that's active projects. Um, again, we have a similar tab here for support work. This one, admittedly, I, I don't understand the exact science to this. This is one of those tabs that like we're iterating on. Trying to figure out and forecast support work has been something that's been really tricky for us. Not a big portion of what we do. Probably represents about 20% of our business at this point. Um, it's, it, we're, it supports a totally different beast, you know. Um, <coughs> so in this case, I don't think I don't. I, you know, I'm just trying to get some data, um, and then gonna go from there. So on this one, you know, we're. Uh, I'm not gonna d talk too much about this one because it's not great. But like, you know, um, trying to look at. This is basically got some rough algorithms in here to look at. Okay, well, historically, how many hours have we billed on average for the for this support contract? You know, we set up our support contracts generally like not to exceed. We don't do retainers, but it's like not to exceed 10 hours a month or 20 hours a month or 50 hours a month. And then we kind of try to figure out, well, you know, on the one hand, you know, if we're really good at kind of being proactive with a customer, like we might be able to bill more hours under that support contract because we might be able to identify things that they want or, you know, figure stuff out and really push, you know. So, you know, we, we, ha we know we have a max that we can't, a cap that we can't go over every month, but we can hit that cap. Um, there might be other times where, um, you know, we have a cap, but a client just doesn't ever hit it. Their site's really stable. They don't have a lot of feature requests. So, you know, the cap might be 10 hours, but in reality, we're doing security updates every month, and it's like two hours of work. You know, so what we're trying to do here is kind of figure out well what's what's our average velocity, 
you know, what's our max velocity daily? And, and then, um, you know, for a projected period, you know, going through this date, and I just have it through the end of Q1, like how many business days are there? What's our averages? What's our max? And then try to f have this spreadsheet kind of figure out, well, what, what could we bill under this? Um, and then what's kind of a realistic scenario for that? Does that make sense? This, this tab, admittedly, like every organization is different. I, I, I haven't nailed this one, but it represents about 20% of the business. So I'm not, if it's off by 50%, like it's not throwing off all of our numbers that badly. So it's just kind of a predictive one. Um, the sales pipeline, this one, uh, as a sales guy, I love and spend a lot of time in. So again, this is just going back to that contract spreadsheet, pulling in the percentage likelihood to close for these projects. Um, from that other tab, from that first tab, the likelihood of stuff to close, and then what is the actual weighted value of your sales of our sales pipeline? Um, we 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 just have some kind of internal, not even written down kind of just rules of the road. You know, it's kind of and we have a sales meeting every week, and our sales team kind of sits down and we just kind of play we kind of play poker on it to figure out what it is. Different folks have more you know more kind of robust categorizations on that. And if you use like Pipe Drive or one of those, some of those project products, they'll they'll actually have stages that are set. You know, so if a project's been submitted and you're in best and final, it gets 40% likely to close. We found that kind of having rough criteria for that wasn't as nuanced as we want because like best and final, if you're doing that final presentation and there's two people that you're bidding against versus 10, like the percentages should be different. You know, so we just kind of we just kind of horse trade to figure that out. Um, so, um, you know, we have our proposal value and the billing rate. And again, like each project might have a slightly different billing rate if you're trying to like increase the value, you know, increase your billing rate. Percentage likelihood to close. And then this is the weighted value, the weighted number of hours given the likelihood to close and then the weighted value given the likelihood of to close. Um, yeah, we have a CRM, we use Zoho. I'm not super stoked on it. Um, it's ironic that we're Salesforce leads and we don't use Salesforce, but Salesforce is freaking expensive. We use it for nonprofits, so it's free for them. So, um, but uh, um, yeah, we you know we 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 use a CRM mostly for marketing stuff. To be honest, like the reports, we just couldn't figure out. I'm a terrible developer, so I just I didn't want to have to try to figure out API stuff to populate this from something else. So it's a little duplication, you know. Um, but, uh, but again, like, okay, so how many, and that allows us to have this roll up, how many hours do we have in our pipeline? What's the face value of that sales pipeline? Because like, these are also two different ways of looking at it. What's the face value of all the leads that we're going after? Um, and then what's the pipeline value if we kind of adjust for percentage likelihood to close on each of those per projects? And that allows us to figure out what's the face value, um, effective billing rate that we can anticipate for the stuff that's in the pipeline versus um, what's the weighted value knowing that different things are more likely or not. That makes sense? Cool, so that lets us ha roll up to this single dashboard right here. And again, this I just kind of keep this open all the time um, throughout the day. And this is kind of like the 10,000 foot view. If we take all of our active builds, you know, we take our support work that we have, we take our sales pipeline, what is kind of our forecast? What's our um, runway moving forward? So I get the details again, just just kind of pulling in the de the recaps from each of those other spreadsheets, and then these numbers right here, these four numbers, are the ones that um, if I did stay up at night and not be able to sleep, would be the things that I would stress about the most. Um, so taking everything, sales pipeline, everything that we have, how many hours from today moving forward with likelihood to close and support and all that, can I kind of just anticipate that our team needs? Um, again, these are made of values. What's the value of that work? Um, what's the effective billing rate for that work? What's the average billing rate going to be be there? And then knowing what my costs are in this case, you know, 100,000 of these current this kind of made up currency. What's my runway? Like, what what can I comfortably say that like if we stop selling, if we didn't have any change orders, you know, if we if we didn't do any additional sales work from today forward, like what can I anticipate? in terms of the number of months that I have available to me. So for us with this, I'll say that I like this number to be like seven and a half months, you know, 
that's all that's all a matter of risk a matter of like cash flow a matter of like cash reserves um, all of that kind of a, other information that's just like a decision that you have you know tolerance for risk and stuff like that but for me um, and for our business you know I'll just say we like to keep uh, I'll be very transparent with you guys we like to keep like probably two months worth of expenses cash in the bank then we want to have like another three months or another two months of accounts receivable so stuff that we've billed but you know you never know if that it's not cash you don't know that people are going to pay it and then like a month or two of credit so um, that's kind of like what we have you know obviously accounts receivable cash in the bank those numbers are variable so we're still trying to work out what would be the right algorithm for that because they're not worth the same you know um, three months of cash receivable and no cash it doesn't matter you know you're kind of screwed um, and then that line of credit like we would never want to ever touch our line of credit but just kind of having that out there just kind of allows us to kind of worst case scenario things um, and then in terms of our runway you know for us 20 person shop being fairly con very conservative fiscally you know we we try to have at least six months of work lined up in terms of support and active projects um, and then I'd say another um, well, not six. I'd say like four months. Six would be awesome. But again, like it's this, it, there's a balancing act between amount of work that we have under contract versus what's in the sales pipeline, you know, and those kind of go up and down um, correspondingly. Um, I'd say probably like three to five months of work under contract that we haven't touched and then another like three to six months of stuff that's in the sales pipeline. Does that make sense? Cool. All right. Um, <coughs> that only gives us like two minutes, two, three minutes for questions. If you guys have any questions or feedback or stuff that we're totally missing here that means our business sucks? What's up? That's a great question. Um, uh, we don't uh, practice open books um, because I think to practice open books takes a level of maturity um, in your management style that like if you open books done wrong is catastrophic. You know, um, so we in our organization we have a we have a what we call our small council. It's, it's our kind of uh, director level folks as plus a couple other folks who kind of like have operational roles. And with those folks, we're very trans we're, uh, transparent on top line numbers and bottom line numbers. Some of the stuff on salary, um, we've been slow to kind of roll that out. You know, it's a new thing to, for us to have a middle management structure. So we've, again, like just wanted to make sure that that information is useful to those managers. Um, so we're kind of rolling that out and educating directors on how to make salary, you know, hiring decisions. You know, being a team of 20 and having four directors and two C-level staff is a little bit overkill, but it's kind of like, you know, for us it's a future-proofing thing, so we're rolling it out. Um, but yeah, I mean, some shops do that. Everybody knows what everybody else makes. Um, and, I, and I've heard of it being effective, but like it can also get really misconfusing. Mis yeah, I think the thing there that's tricky is like stupid developers get more expensive every year. So it's like, you know, sometimes the raises have a, are on a different schedule from like what you need because like you just closed a deal, you have to have somebody tomorrow. And so you're negotiating, like it gets a little awkward sometimes if you don't if you don't have the time to tell everybody everything. <laughs> like yeah. But you're a larger team too, right? Yeah, so yeah, so you guys have some different things you're dealing with. Um, anything else? What's that? Um, well, with that's mostly in the sales pipeline. Oh, like actual lead gen. We we're you know we're we're just that's an area where I need to focus this summer. Like we I don't have great metrics on that. Um, you know we're starting like once a quarter to do. That's an area where we're iterating really quickly. Like win loss rates. Um, stuff like that. It's also an interesting one, like marketing dollars, like what month of revenue should be tracked against the marketing dollars to know how effective they are. Because obviously the marketing you do this month is not the revenue you make this month. So trying to figure that out. Um, if folks have ideas on this and have other templates, I'd love, let's share them over Twitter and let's keep a dialogue going because I don't know what the right answer is there. We're still playing with it. What's that?
Yeah, that, we have a different spreadsheet. Um, like I said, like we're, we're exploring whether or not Forecast app could replace it. Um, but uh, we have just a big spreadsheet that is every staff person, every project they're working on, all the unassigned work for each different project and by different category. And we kind of, we just horse trade with that. The project managers love it. It's, 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 uh, it's, very, it's a very crude tool. Like there's just a lot of, uh, you can, it's prone to user error. Um, but it's the best tool we could come up with. We have a, we have a resource allocation meeting every week. Um, and then every other week we have an AM, PM, account management, project management meeting. And so we're constantly just trying to, it's, it's very manual. Unfortunately, I wish that it wasn't. Are most of the projects uh, No, well, it's all fixed. It's all time and materials, not to exceed. Yeah. So. How does that, um, how does the resource allocation work with the program teams? Is it the same amount of hours in the contract have a start and end date as opposed to a deadline allocated over time? Yeah. Things are staggered based on the project. Yeah. It, it it plays into it, it 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 keys off of this billable hours matrix to try to understand what are reasonable what are reasonable commitments we can make based on staff, you know, and that's something too. Like uh, PTO debt is an interesting one too. Um, you know, people don't take people earn you know four point six hours of PTO every single week, but they don't take four point six hours every week. So um, that's another thing. Sorry, I had that turned on. That's not me. Um, so we have a, um, yeah, so that's another kind of, we do it in our P&L report at the end of the month. Like, if we'd made a ton of money in a, in a given month, but nobody took any PTO, then, you know, that's great from a cash flow perspective, but we're accumulating PTO debt, like technical debt, that comes up down the road, you know, typically December or whatnot. So, um, yeah, so that's, and Zenefits actually has some decent reporting on, on that. Um, that kind of help out a bit. So, cool. Anything else? We are over on time. Yeah. Uh, maybe I need to change the access control. <laughs>